old empty house. Why are you afraid of a house? Hey ghost heads, it's Heidi from Channeling Spirits, and today we dare you to explore the history of that iconic architecture we all imagine at the mention of a haunted house. Join us as we discuss how a symbol of affluence became the model setting for the supernatural. We will be as comprehensive as we can while we delve deep into the vast history, but naturally, we won't be able to cover everything. Our hope is to explain what factors changed the public's perceptions of once noble manners into the dwellings of the dead. We'll also discuss the particular architectural elements of the classic mansion what brought them in vogue, and more importantly, how they decayed into the haunted houses we know and love. Before we can step inside the gates of how the archetypal haunted houses came to be, we'll have to explore the road that led up to it. A haunted house is now a common cliche in Gothic fiction, but its prototype, the haunted castle, was even older. Largely regarded as the first Gothic story, the Castle of Otranto, by Horace Warpole also introduced this backdrop. Written in 1764, the story follows Manfred, the lord of an ancient and foreboding fortress, grow terrified as his son is killed by supernatural forces and a prophecy spelling the end of his bloodline. The story laid the groundwork for themes prevalent in Gothic fiction, exploring decaying castles, evil aristocrats, forbidden love, dark and ominous landscapes, and of course, the supernatural. Gothic fiction would continue to flourish, fostered by several authors' contributions, but perhaps the most famous was the man who invented the mystery genre, Edgar Allan Poe. In April 1839, Poe published The Haunted Palace, a poem that tells the decay of a monarch's high estate. The poem uses the palace as an allegory for the king's mental state, the estate's physical structures are compared to facial features and the phantoms are both spectral and psychological. This notion of a haunted house being a character itself and having human features has become very common. You know, a house is like a person's body. The walls are like bones, the pipes are veins. With vacant eye-like windows and a doorway like a mouth, the question becomes, is the house sentient and haunting the inhabitants? Or are the residents projecting their phantoms onto the house? Later, in 1839, Poe would publish his famous The Fall of the House Usher, which would include the haunted palace and further the idea of a crumbling house symbolizing the human body's disintegration. Being a relatively young country, the United States didn't have ancient castles. The well-off lived in manors and mansions which were significantly newer, but served the same effect for the Gothic reader. But at this time, the haunted house we know so well hadn't taken root in the collective consciousness. In fact, in 1851, Nathaniel Hawthorne's classic, The House of the Seven Gables, was based on the 17th century colonial mansion. It would be another 14 years before an architectural style would rise in popularity and then descend into the place for poltergeists. Second Empire architecture was popular in the United States and Canada from 1865 to the turn of the century. Its namesake came from the redevelopment of Paris under Napoleon III's Second Empire. In this time, it was known as modern French, or simply French, but its features will be immediately recognizable. One of the key elements is the mansard roof, a four-side gambrel side roof with a flat top and sloping sides that are punctured by dormer windows. The roof ridge is often decorated with cresting, iron trim, which is decorative, but occasionally functions as lightning rods. Narrow eaves with decorative support brackets line the bottom of the roof. The tower is another typical feature in Second Empire houses, which sometimes bisects the home or stands asymmetrically. Wooden clapboard is typically for the siding with several tall, narrow windows. Other common elements are bay windows, balconies, and small entry porches. The wildly publicized reconstruction of the Louvre Palace and the 1855 Exposition Universale brought Second Empire architecture into international spotlight, 
the style conjured ideas of modernity and cleanliness, which contrasted the outdated revival styles of Italianante and Gothic that brought to mind the Renaissance and Middle Ages, respectively. Ironically, the Second Empire would eventually fall out of vogue and prey to reminding the public of a bygone era. Following the American Civil War, the northern states were prospering while the South struggled. The rich looked for ways to express their wealth and flocked to the Second Empire aesthetic. The upper class built empires for incoming immigrants leading to both tenements and the first billion dollar corporation. Advances in electrification and the invention of automobiles hearkened a new era. This growth brought demands for social progress, like the Antitrust Act, and allowed artists to abandon traditional philosophies. Among these was the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who began a period of experimentation with his prairie houses. Wright's houses were seen as the Second Empire was once a half a century before. Modern and hygienic, Full of light and open, the Second Empire's narrow windows restricted daylight and their design unintentionally collected dust. Colors were duller simply from the limitations of their age, and furniture prone to being bleached by the sun was blocked with heavy curtains. The ornate designs were now seen as superfluous and excessive. Though celebrated ghost stories were still being written, like Henry James' 1898 The Turn of the Screw, Gothic literature was also in decline. Real horrors like the Great War and Great Depression consumed the American psyche. The corruption and overindulgence of the Gilded Age was embodied in the Second Empire houses of yesterday. One of the best depictions of the Second Empire's desolation came from the American artist Edward Hopper. Hopper is now most known for his work Nighthawks, but in 1925 he painted House by the Railroad. Devoid of people, the lonely house sits quietly as the sun sets on it. Hopper's friend and contemporary, Guy Penet Dubois, said this of the piece. There is a stillness, which has its counterpart in the calm preceding a storm, and an ominous lull, eerie, void, inhuman. These dead American houses, Victorian in architecture, generally ugly, whimsical exaggerations in tortured wood, are haunted. Whether Hopper produced this consciously or not, I cannot say. Second Empire architecture gradually became intertwined with dark old houses. In 1937, Disney released a cartoon called Lonesome Ghosts, which depicted a decrepit building housing a group of ghosts. A year later, Charles Adams would draw his first in a series of comics depicting the ghoulish Adams family. Before creating his infamous characters, Adams was hired to remove much of the blood and gore from photos featured in True Detective magazine. He would lament how he would have preferred to keep them as they were. Adams had his family dwell in a dreary abode with a Second Empire exterior. The inspiration is said to be a Westfield house on Elm Street he frequently passed as a teenager. He spent his formative years lurking in cemeteries and breaking into abandoned buildings to draw skeletons. His penchant with the macabre would lead to him being commissioned to draw a beautiful haunted house for Mademoiselle magazine, published aside an up-and-coming author, Ray Bradbury. A year later, in 1947, Weird Tales would have its own spooky Second Empire house on its cover. In 1951, while Walt Disney was ruminating ideas of opening the first theme park, he had Harper Goff create a concept drawing for an old dark house on the hill. It would have overlooked a church and a graveyard on Main Street, but that idea was shelved. A ride exploring a ghost-ridden house would open in 1969 as the Haunted Mansion, but both Disneyland and Disney World would feature a different facade. Neither ride would feature Second Empire architecture until Euro Disney's Phantom Manor opened in 1992. In 1959, Shirley Jackson published The Haunting of Hill House. While researching her novel, Jackson claimed she found a photo of a San Francisco mansion in a magazine that inspired her Hill House. She asked her mother, who lived in California, for more information on the home, only to find her great-great-grandfather, Samuel Bugby, had designed it. 
He was an architect who built several of the old Knob Hill mansions, including the Crocker House. Not all modern depictions of the haunted house were Victorian, though 1959's House on Haunted Hills poster shows a more traditional haunt, the film ironically used the Ennis Brown house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. The haunting, based on Jackson's novel, used the Eddington Park Hotel for the exterior shots of Hill House. If Second Empire architecture hadn't been sufficiently associated with horror, Alfred Hitchcock's magnum opus, Psycho, cemented it. The inspiration for the Bates Motel was Hopper's House by the Railroad. Hopper was delighted to learn the idea for the house in the film was credited to him. Hitchcock's films took quite a bit of inspiration from Hopper's work, which Joel Gunz had detailed extensively and you can read in this link below. But Hopper wasn't the only artist Hitchcock enjoyed. One day, he showed up at Charles Adams' front door and said, I've just come to see you in your natural bailiwick. Hitchcock also owned two original cartoons by Adam and made mention of him in North by Northwest. The three of you together. Now that's a picture only Charles Adams could draw. The monster craze of the 60s brought the Adams family to television in 1964. The Munsters, a similar family that mixed humor and horror, debuted that same year. The Adams Family Mansion was an actual home in Los Angeles, but not as it appeared in the show. The third floor and tower were added as a matte painting to give it the appearance of the Second Empire style and sadly was demolished in 1967. The Munster House, known as Maxim House, was built in the Universal Studio backlot and has its own varied history. It appeared in several films, television shows, and sits next to the Harvey House. The Harvey House has connections to the Bates House, which James Rolfe has detailed in his video, What Happened to the Psycho House. When Scooby-Doo Where Are You debuted in 1969, the Scooby Gang frequented spooky old castles and houses, with the Second Empire style featured in the second season's intro. The Maitland's house in Beetlejuice also shares those French features. Lego has even based its haunted house design on what has become the quintessential depiction. Even as recently as 2017's remake of It, has the Second Empire architecture still being used as the epitome of where we fear to tread. There is no doubt about it that thousands of depictions in any variety of media showcase the Second Empire style as the haunted house. If you've enjoyed this video and think we deserve it, it was terrible, it was just terrible. I'll never get over it as long as I live. Please subscribe. I'm Heidi with Channeling Spirits, and thanks for watching.